Numbers chapter 20, I invite you to turn with me there. Numbers chapter 20. The, the Brit- British Open Championship, or at least that's how many on this side of the pond refer to it, across the pond where it's held every year, they refer to it as the Open Championship. Many over here refer to it as the British Open. It's one of the four major tournaments in the golf world each year. You have the Masters, and that's coming up just a couple of weeks that we host in Georgia down in Augusta every year. You have the U.S. Open, you have the British Open, and you have the PGA Championship. In 2014, the British Open was held at Royal Liverpool Golf Club in Hoylake, England. For Ernie Els, a professional golfer from Johannesburg, South Africa, the tournament could not have started any worse. In fact, one could argue that Els lost the tournament on his very first shot. There's a saying in professional golf that you you can lose the tournament on round in round 1, but you can't win the tournament. You can't win the tournament in round 1, but you can certainly lose it. But you say, "John, this was just his first shot of round 1. There's four rounds. How in the world can you lose it on your first shot?" Well, it went like this. Ernie hit his opening tee shot at the tournament. And he hooked it left into the gallery of patrons. And it hit a 60-something-year-old gentleman right in the face. And when you consider the fact that his ball speed's about 165 miles an hour, a hard golf ball flying into the face of a human being could do considerable damage, and it did. The man was bleeding profusely. He was in terrible shape by the time Ernie arrived where he had hit the man. He ended up being taken to the hospital. As you can imagine... If you had done something accidentally that impacted somebody so tragically and so significantly, you would be rattled. Ernie was rattled. Golf is a very mental game. On that first hole, he would end up taking three putts. Okay, do you know what a putt is in golf? You do it at the putt-putt course, okay? From inside two feet inside two feet. It took him three attempts to get in, inside two feet. Now, you may do that at the putt-putt course because you play one or two times a year, but professional golfers very seldom miss inside two feet. And if they miss once, they don't miss twice and need three shots. It took him three shots. He would go on to post a seven on the first hole, par being four. That's a triple bogey. Not good in golf and not the way you want to start the tournament. By the time the first nine holes, a a tournament around is 18 holes, okay, for those that don't know golf, just halfway through the first round, by the time he had finished nine holes, he was already six over par. Not good. He would finish seventh over par at the end of round one, which put him at, at 148 out of 156. The next day, while he played a little bit better, he posted a plus one the next day, one over par. He was plus eight for the tournament, and thus he did not make the cut. In other words, he didn't get a play Saturday, Sunday, the third and fourth rounds of the tournament. He was out. It was over for him, realistically, after his first shot. One shot. And everything went south in a hurry. If only he could have a mulligan. Mulligans are amateur golfers' best friends. But in professional golf, mulligans are not legal. A free do-over where your bad shot didn't have any consequences. As in pro golf, life, and more importantly, God, does not give mulligans. To be sure, God is merciful. He is very merciful. He is very patient. And we talk about God giving us second and third and and multiple chances and opportunities, but they're not mulligans in the true sense of the word. You see, with a mulligan, it's as though your bad shot never happened. 
There's no repercussions from your bad shot. Your score isn't negatively affected with a mulligan in golf. But that is not the case in life. That is not the case with God. Yes, God forgives. Yes, God shows mercy. Yes, God gives additional opportunities. But there are still consequences for our sinful choices because God is just. He cannot just let sin go unnoticed and undisciplined. God doesn't just say, "Um, let's pretend I didn't see that. Go ahead and try again. God doesn't do that. He can't do that. It goes against his nature and his character. Yes, Ernie's hopes of winning his third British Open were realistically gone, as it would turn out with just one shot, his first. And in our text today in Numbers chapter 20, Moses' shot to enter the promised land was gone with one action. One sinful action born out of a moment of frustration and anger, and Moses couldn't have a mulligan. He couldn't rewind time 15 minutes and do a take two. Today, we see the danger of unrighteous anger, the danger of unrighteous anger. Look at verse 1 of Deuteronomy 20. The people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord said, spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff. And assemble the congregation, you and Aaron and your your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water, so you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank in their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel... Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord. And through them, he showed himself holy. Friends, anger and the actions born out of our unrighteous anger have devastating consequences. It negatively impacts the recipients of our angry actions. Sometimes innocent bystanders, innocent observers are negatively affected by our angry actions. We are negatively impacted by our angry actions because we're in sin the work that God is striving to do, the perfecting work, sanctifying work that God is striving to do in us is halted when we respond in anger and we put ourselves in a position to receive His discipline rather than a place to receive His blessing. And perhaps most importantly, the name of Christ, the Christ that we claim to know and to love and to follow, 
When we call ourselves Christians, we are calling ourselves little Christ ones. The name of Christ, rather than being magnified and exalted, is maligned. Instead of people being drawn to Christ through our sweet, loving disposition, people have no reason or desire to pursue Him because of our unrighteous anger. I want you to notice first and jot down this. Unrighteous anger is sinful in its attitudes. It is sinful in its attitudes. Moses started out right. He started out well. He and Aaron yet again have become the object of the people's grumbling and contempt. It's happened over and over and over. We've seen it in our study repeatedly. And he did what he was accustomed to do when the people would come grumble and complain at him or against him. What would he do? He would often go to the tent of meeting with Aaron and they would fall on their face before God. That is good. That is right. That's what he should have done. That we should follow. When people malign us, when they slander us, when they get angry at us, when they complain against us, when they harm us, when they wrong us, what should we do? We should go in humility to Christ so that He can accomplish His purpose in our lives and in their lives through this situation. That's what we should do. Moses started out right. And sometimes when we do that, God may see fit to bring about some kind of rather sudden vindication. We've seen now several times where he's done that recently. When, when Moses' own sister and brother, Miriam and Aaron, complained against Moses and said, God hasn't only spoken through you. God struck Miriam with leprosy instantly. There was instant vindication. When the 12, 12 spies were sent in Numbers 14, we saw this some weeks ago, into the land of promise. And the 10 guys came back and said, well, yeah, it's, it's good like God said, but man, you ought to see the people there. And they were more enthralled and captivated by the size of the sandals of the people rather than the God who had provided the land for them. We look like grasshoppers compared to these people. We cannot go in and do this. God killed those men. So there were times when God had brought about instant vindication. But remember, vindication is God's responsibility. It is not your responsibility. It is not my responsibility. Romans 12, 19, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God did manifest his glory. He did meet with Moses and Aaron. In fact, he gave them very clear instructions on what to do. Take your staff, go to the rock, and tell the rock to give its water But here, unlike some of those recent ones that we just referred to, God didn't address the sinful attitudes, the grumblings of the people. He didn't do that. And it's possible that maybe that's what contributed to Moses doing what he did. Our unrighteous anger is sinful in its attitude. It reveals an it's-all-about-me attitude. He took the complaining of the people personally. You say, well, John, really, who can blame him? (laughs) This has been going on for years. He's put up with this kind of stuff. And, and you and I acknowledge, yeah, it would be really hard not to take it personally, wouldn't it? As, as much as he's put up with it. Time and time again, they've complained against his leadership. They've assigned unkind, untrue motives to Moses throughout this entire journey. They've not submitted to his leadership. They've complained against him and God. It was very common, unfortunately, And most of the time, in fact, up until this point, Moses has always been able to respond with the patience of Job. But at this particular moment, Moses had had enough. He couldn't take it anymore. He wouldn't take it anymore. Why? What was different here? Why did Moses buckle and cave here? When all the times we've seen him before, he hasn't. I reflected for quite a while about this, wondering what was different. Why did Moses respond like he did here? And he didn't do that at any other time since leading the people of Israel. And several things came to my mind. There's no way we can know for sure. But but here's a couple of ideas. It could be because God recently had been responding in some kind of instant vindication of Moses and judging the people for their complaining. And he didn't do it again here. 
That's one possibility. It could be, you know, we've talked about the fact that he has seen this over and over and over again for 40 years almost at this point. And this could be the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. He had finally reached his limit. He wasn't going to take it anymore. It could be that Moses somehow in this moment saw himself as the provider of the water. All right, these people need water. I'm their leader. I've got to provide it for them. And he put undue pressure and stress on himself. Now, he shouldn't have felt that way because God had already told him how to do it. And every other time God had done it. But when you look at verse 10, it would seem to indicate that somehow Moses is putting this on himself and on Aaron. Look, on Aaron, look what he says. Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock. In other words, it's about Moses. There's another possibility. Look at verse 1. Look at the last part of verse 1. Miriam died there and was buried. His sister has recently passed away, and perhaps his emotions are still raw from losing his sister. And, and if you've lost a loved one, you know how you can be on edge in your time of grieving, and you may not respond clearly. Um, you may not be able to think clearly. You might, may not always respond kindly to people when you're grieving. That's a possibility. So, so here's several ideas. We, we can't know if any or none or all of these had some kind of factor. And so I was thinking a little bit deeper. Is there something else that's different here that would cause him to do this? And then I realized something. There is something, and we can say this is ab- at, at whatever, however those other things may have factored into this, this one here now we can count on for sure as being the ultimate reason why Moses responded the way he did. Go back to Exodus. You don't have to turn there. Remember Exodus 32. Moses is with God for an extended period of time up on the mountain as God is giving his laws to, to Moses to give to the people. And what did the people do below? God said, Moses, you need to get back down the mountain, down to the foot of the mountain, because your people, God says to Moses, your people have sinned a great sin And they're in idolatry. They've made an idol and they're worshiping the golden calf. Remember that? And God was so angry with the people. God said, Moses, you know what? These people, they continually rebel against me. They've made idols. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm so angry with them. I'm just going to wipe them all out and I'm going to start over with you, Moses. Do you remember Moses' response? God, please don't do that. Because if you wipe these people out, then all these surrounding pagan people are going to say, well, what kind of God is that? He just brought his people out of of Egypt so he could kill them all in the wilderness. God, that's not like you. Your name is going to take a bad rap. Your reputation is going to be tarnished significantly if you do that. What was Moses concerned about when God was angry with the people of Israel? Moses appealed to God to be merciful to the people on the basis of God's character, God's person, God's reputation. Moses was concerned first and foremost with God's reputation, not himself. Fast forward to Numbers 14. Again, when the 12 spies went in and 10 came back and said, no, we can't do this. And two said, yes, we can. But the 10, no, we can't, won the day. They won out. And God, again, same story. I'm I'm furious with these people. I'm going to wipe them all out. It's very similar to Exodus 32. And Moses again appeals to God on the basis of God's care. God, please don't. Your character is going to take a hit. Your reputation is going to be tarnished. If you do this, these people are not going to understand who you, the true God, are. Moses appealed to God on the basis of God's character and reputation. And then we come to Numbers 20. And they're complaining again. And Moses doesn't show any regard or concern for God's character and person and reputation. Moses has personalized this. He's made it about me. Listen to me, you rebels. We're going to do this. Moses 
focus here is not God and God's glory. Moses focuses on himself and how the people have wronged him again. And closely associated with that all about me mentality and attitude, unrighteous anger believes it has to make things right. I've got to fix this. I've got to take this into my own hands. I'm going to make you pay for what you've done. You see, Moses' focus wasn't on God, and because he was angry, he was going to make this about him and what he was going to do and how he was going to provide. Are we going to provide? We're going to provide this water for you. His words were such that he was he and Aaron were taking the credit as though by their power and, and their goodness they were providing water for the people. He made it about him. We're going to fix this problem, you bunch of ingrates. We have to solve your problem, friends. Both of these attitudes, making it all about me. And I have to set things straight. I have to set the record straight. I have to fix this. They're wrong. They're sinful. Because we're called to be disciples of Christ. And as Christ followers, he said, if you're going to be one of mine, you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross and follow me. That's not what Moses was doing here. He was making this about him instead of denying himself. This attitude causes us to forget that we are, in fact, channels, vessels of God's manifold grace to people. Talked about that in the, the Serving Sunday coming up next week. You have an incredible opportunity to go be the hands and feet of Jesus and minister grace to somebody that needs help, whether it's just spending time talking with them because they can't get out, encouraging them, or doing something physically for them. But when we lose sight of that, we think and act as though we're the authors of grace, we're the providers of all they need. And as a result, people see us instead of seeing Christ. The image of Christ is badly obscured when we make it about us and what they see in us is not pretty. You see, see, all the people saw here, they saw nothing of God. Not one person, it's not recorded, and I can't imagine that one person walked away from this moment saying, our, our God is great and awesome. He brought water out of the rock because Moses was standing up there in anger, striking the thing. All right, you want water? You need water? All right, we'll give it to you. Wham, wham. That's that's a different Moses than we've seen. I wonder, wonder what was up with him today. But, but, it, but at least he gave us water. Uh, I don't know what his deal was, but at least we got our water. And there's no reflection or reference to God and his provision. The people saw something, but it was the ugly, unrighteous anger of a self-focused man in that moment. Friends, when we... When we get this, that, that, that this is really about God and not about us, this is freeing to us, especially when we're in a place of leadership. And we know that as, as, when we are following Christ, if people are opposing us, it's not really us they're opposing, they're actually opposing God. This happened to Samuel in 1 Samuel 8, when the people were clamoring for a king. We want a king. We want to be like all the other countries. Samuel... Uh, we, we, we just want a king. Nothing against you, but we want a king. We don't just want this prophet that speaks to God, God and God speaks to uh, on our behalf. We want, we want a king. And Samuel's broken, and he goes to God, and God says, Hey, Samuel, don't worry. It's not you. They're ultimately rejecting. It's me. What we do in anger is an, is an attempt to make right how we were wronged. You see, anger seeks to vindicate itself. It seeks revenge on the offending party when the revenge is to be left to God. God will settle the score in his time, and he can do a far better job than you and I can. Let people see Christ, not you. So unrighteous anger, it's sinful in its attitudes, but jot this one down as well. It's sinful in its behavior. It's sinful in its behavior because it disobeys God, plain and simple. Moses clearly disobeyed God. God told him to talk to the rock. Tell, just all you got to do is speak to it. Just tell it to give its water and it will. And in anger, he lashed out at the people verbally, and then he beat the rock. He struck it two times. And notice what's true about this sinful anger. It's, 
the speech that we speak in our sinful anger is inflammatory and condemning. Listen to me, you rebels. You can hear the anger and the inflammatory term designed to disparage the people. You say, well, John, what's the problem with them calling them rebels? I mean, after all, didn't God call them rebels? And weren't they being rebels? Yeah, yeah, they were. The problem was not the use of the term. The problem was that Moses used the term while he was being a rebel himself. It's as though Moses was putting himself up. You guys are being rebellious in this moment, but boy, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm up here and you're down here, you rebels. He was putting himself up while putting them down. The problem was he was down there with them because he was being a rebel in his heart at the moment. That was the problem. And what made it worse was he was in a position of leadership. He was the mediator between God and the people. And he was acting in anger and rebellion in his own heart in this moment. And he blew it. He did not sanctify. He did not lift up God as holy in this moment to the people. Our speech in unrighteous anger is is inflammatory and it's condemning, but the actions are violent and destructive. Moses lost his self-control in this moment, and he took out the frustration on the rock, striking it not just once, but twice When God had said, all you have to do is talk to it. Tell it to give the water, and it will. That's all he had to do. But no, he was angry, and someone or something was going to feel his wrath. You may be saying, well, John, we need to cut Moses a little slack, because this kind of scenario has unfolded before, right? And, and, And a rock was involved to bring water. And at that point, this was years ago, God said, Moses, strike the rock. So... So maybe he just got a little confused and lost track of what God said because in the past, God had told him to strike the rock. But it's plain and simple. This time, God's instructions were very different. Just speak to it. Just tell it. The last time he was supposed to hit it, this time was a different time, and the instructions were different. And there's a reason, because the rock was meant to be a picture of Christ. Paul the Apostle will write in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, They all drank from the spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. You see, the rock that provided the water represented Christ. And the first rock was struck once, and from it flowed the fountain of water that gave life to parched, thirsty souls. So Christ himself was struck once for all, and from him flowed a fountain of blood that gives life to sinful, dying people who will look to him and live. But Christ was only struck once, and the rock was only to be struck the one time, and that was years earlier. That had already happened. This time it was just to be spoken to. It was not to be struck again because Christ was only struck once. But Moses damaged that picture by striking, striking the rock again on this second occasion. Friends, words spoken in anger are often inflammatory. They're often condemning. They're often disparaging because we're trying to put others down so we can feel better about ourselves. When we're often just as guilty as they are, just like Moses did here. And this is a direct violation of God's truth on multiple levels. Words spoken in anger fail to show love to your enemies. Matthew 5, 44. Words spoken in anger fail to love others the way Christ has loved us, John 13, 34. Words spoken in anger fail to let your speech be always gracious, seasoned with salt, Colossians 4, verse 6. Words spoken in anger fail to follow the command in Ephesians 4, 29, when it says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, and ministers grace to those who are listening. These words that are spoken in anger, speech born out of anger, is a direct violation of God's commands and is sin. We can see pretty easily how 
violent, destructive behavior, especially when it's directed at others, is wrong and sinful. We get that. We understand that. We're told not to seek revenge, but we're to love instead. These words and these actions and in, in, in unrighteous anger are not consistent with the mind and character and love of Christ. And it's not good for anybody involved, ourselves or anybody else. The pain, the grief, the destructive consequences are far-reaching. And they can last a lifetime. You probably remember hurtful, harsh things people have said to you years and years ago. You say, well, John, come on, it was just a rock. I mean, that didn't hurt anybody. It's not like he hit somebody in the face. It was a rock. Can't I vent my anger on inanimate objects as long as I'm not hurting people or, or at least animals? And my question to you is, is that venting your frustration, is that consistent with God's person and character to be violent and destructive? When is God violent and destructive? When He is judging sin. And you and I are not the judge of sin. God alone is. That's when God is violent and destructive, when He is judging sin. Beyond that, He's not violent and destructive. And so we should not be violent and destructive. Even against inanimate objects, we should have self-control to accurately reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what characterizes your life? As we pull this together, I'm not going to ask questions as I often do. I've been asking some throughout, but I want to leave you with several practical takeaways that we need to reflect on. Number one, even the best people fail in areas where they are normally strong. I've shared the last couple Wednesday nights about as we have been praying about several situations where um, the church is not wanting to follow, at least some in the church are not wanting to follow the, the leadership. Uh, another situation where some um, highly respected, looked up to leaders in a particular ministry, um, there apparently has been some underlying sin issues that, that have been going on and and, and that uh, may be about to be exposed. And what happens when leadership sins and blows it and the devastating effects it has on those who follow them because there's just this natural tendency to lift certain people up, especially those in, an, in leadership, and put them on a pedestal and, and almost some even take the approach, well, I can't just, I can't even imagine them doing something wrong or sinning, which is not a proper understanding of the depravity of every human being. Don't put people up on a pedestal as though they can do no wrong or they never blow it. I had a conversation with somebody this week. I said, you remember how I've told you don't put me or any other spiritual leader up on a pedestal because invariably they will let you down in one way? I just let you down because we were supposed to meet and I double booked because I didn't put it in my thing, and I'm sorry, I let you down. <laughs> Thankfully, that's all it was. But I did. I let him down because I didn't meet, because I didn't put it in my calendar, and I double booked myself. Okay? Even the best. And Moses, <laughs> I could not have survived, at least I don't think I could, the way Moses has survived. Uh, I had a I'd have exercised unrighteous anger somewhere long before this. I just, I just feel like what <laughs> that Moses did. Okay, he's the best, and he still blew it. Number two, God's discipline may not be in line with our thinking, but it is always just and right. You may look at this and say, uh, Moses. We've said a lot about how he has responded time and time again, and we've marveled at it, frankly thinking that we probably wouldn't have handled it like he did. And one time? <laughs> Come on, God, you need to cut Moses some slack. I mean, all that he's put up with for 40 years, I mean, you even, multiple times, you were ready to wipe the people out, and Moses said, no, no, let's think about you and your character and your reputation. 
And one time, he blows it, and, and just for that, he can't go into the promised land? He's put up with this for 40 years and one mistake, and he can't go. God's discipline may not be in line with our thinking, but friends, it is always just and right because God only does what is just and right. If there's a discrepancy between our understanding of what would be appropriate discipline and what God has declared as appropriate discipline, the problem is not on God's end, it is on our end. Of course, God was taking into account Moses' position as the leader, as the mediator between God and the people. And that's one reason, at least, why the discipline was severe as it was. Guard your tongue and your physical actions at all times, but especially when you are angry. Especially when you are angry. The tongue is hard enough to control when, when we're not angry, but it becomes exponentially harder to control when we are angry. And as James 3 reminds us, it can do incredible and does do incredible damage. And when we're angry, it's even magnified and intensified. The results are often far more reaching when we react and speak and act in anger. Display humility when you have responded in unrighteous anger. When you have blown it, and your actions, your attitude, and your, your sinful actions and attitudes got the better of you, because that's what was in your heart, friends, it doesn't come out if it's not in the heart to begin with. All God's doing is exposing to you and to others what's in your heart when you respond in sinful anger. And when you recognize that, whether it's because somebody pointed it out to you, or you just recognize the ugliness of what you just said or did, Respond in humility, fall on your face before God, repent of that sin, and experience His grace and forgiveness. And then last, I would say this. God can still be glorified in spite of your sin. Look at verse 13. Verse 13. These are the waters of Meribah where the people of Israel quarred against the Lord, and through them... Through the people and their quarreling, through Moses and his unrighteous anger, through them he showed himself holy. Is that not amazing? Isn't that incredible? God was still able to bring glory to himself and to show himself as holy in spite of the sinful grumbling and complaining of the people and in spite of Moses' unrighteous anger response. God is still going to bring glory to himself. That is incredible. That is comforting. Now, that's not a free license to go out and sin. Say, well, God's going to bring glory to himself, so I might as well enjoy myself. No. (laughs) You will suffer the consequences of that. That should not be your attitude, Paul says. Absolutely. God forbid. Absolutely not. Should we sin so that grace can abound? God makes His glory known through His servants when they are faithful and obedient to Him. But when they are not faithful and when they are not obedient, He can still, he still makes His glory known in spite of them. He is still sanctified. He will be sanctified. He will be lifted up as holy. The question is, will He be glorified through you because you responded right, or will He be glorified in spite of you? That's the question. Is God glorified through me in my life and the way I'm living right now, or is He being glorified in spite of the way I'm living and conducting myself right now? You see, if He is glorified through you because you're living in submission and obedience to Him, then there will be incredible blessing and reward awaiting you. But, on the other hand, if He is being glorified in spite of you because you're living in disobedience and responding in sinful anger and other things... Not only will there not be blessing and reward, there will be shame, discipline, and regret. Which is it for you? We're not going to turn there, but you might jot down Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. 
It's a list of the fruit of the Spirit. When you think about those, love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, self-control, you go through that list, none of those are present when you respond in unrighteous anger. The key to not responding in unrighteous anger is by being controlled by the Spirit and the Spirit producing that fruit in you because that is incompatible with unrighteous anger. If unrighteous anger is what comes out, then you're not being controlled by the Spirit. You're not being filled with Him. He is not in that moment producing His fruit in you. And that is the goal for every follower of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we acknowledge that We can learn a lot from Moses, mostly through his good examples, his positive examples of how he repeatedly looked to you when he was maligned and accused and spoken badly of. And he did that most of the time, and you acted in mighty ways on his behalf. You vindicated him time and again. You judged the people for their sin And we can learn much from that. Yet, while we can learn much from his positive examples, we can also learn from his negative example here. The harm, the destruction, the long-term consequences that result when we fail to be controlled by your spirit and instead are controlled by our flesh and respond in unrighteous anger. You were actually merciful to Moses because while he was not allowed to enter, in fact, we'll see next time the end of Moses' life and ministry. And he went into your presence not going into the land of promise. But that wasn't the end of the story. You were indeed extremely gracious and merciful to Moses. And we read... In the gospel account, on the mountain of transfiguration, in the land of promise, there's Moses, along with Elijah and Jesus, up on the mountain. And years and years and years later, in your mercy, you allowed him to set foot in the promised land. You are merciful and gracious. But we must respond with humility and repentance where we've blown it. And we must seek to live filled with your spirit so that we respond in graciousness and kindness. Lord, we need you. We can't do it on our own. May we repent, experience forgiveness, and commit to living in obedience, humility, and submission to you so that those around us may see Jesus and not our ugliness and be drawn to him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing in closing, Lord, I need you. We sing a couple different ones here. This is one we haven't sung in a while, but it's extremely fitting and appropriate. And again, it also contrasts when things are going well. We need God then, but we also need him when things are not going so well. It's easy to recognize how he is at work when things are going well. It's more difficult to recognize when they're not going well. So let's bear that in mind. Lord, I need you. Thank you.